out that there was a pipeline actually lying at the bottom of the Straits of Mackinac. The iconic image of the Great Lakes in Michigan, almost directly underneath it, there's this ticking time bomb. I can't imagine a worse place for an oil spill to happen in the Great Lakes. The oil would spread faster, further, and impact more miles of shoreline than, than any place else. A lot of these reports, are, they are very misleading, and they are not entirely accurate. The notion that a, a company like Enbridge would not maintain a line is just, this is atrocious, it's quite false. Oil pipelines. You can't see them, but 2.5 million miles of steel spider webs its way across America. They've run beneath our lakes, rivers, and wetlands in over 18,000 places. And you never really hear about them until they spill. So right below us, you can see the boom deployments in the Indian River that uh, Enbridge and the Coast Guard have deployed. You see those two uh, buoys that are running from right to left into where all those people are standing? That's where it actually crosses the river. What we're looking for is if there's any sheen or any, if there was any release at all, that we'd see, we'd see it right away in, in, a, in a sheen. I'm in Indian River, Michigan, where Enbridge, a Canadian pipeline company, is running an oil spill response drill with the U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and local first responders. They've invited press and local stakeholders to get a glimpse of what a coordinated response looks like when an oil pipeline ruptures into a waterway. Got a lot of Enbridge staff right here. You've got a couple Coast Guard, uh, local police department, local fire department mixed in. So you've got planning, operations, logistics. As you can see, everything's kind of a really, really nice banner printed professionally. Uh, very interesting kind of dog and pony show. The point of the drill was for Enbridge and first responders to practice better coordination in the event of a spill. But the show of oil boom and boats doubled as a public relations event for a company who has a concerning record in the state of it's Michigan. A full scale exercise that we have underway. While the world was fixated on BP's Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico, Enbridge's Line 6B ruptured on July 26, 2010, spilling over 800,000 gallons of oil from the Alberta tar sands into the Kalamazoo River, just outside Marshall, Michigan. It would be the largest inland oil spill in American history. They've just declared a state of emergency here in Calhoun County, and I spoke with an official with the state, and they say this may be the worst oil spill ever in the Midwest. What they thought was a false alarm was a six-foot gash, horizontal gash, in the pipeline that left this gaping tear. And out of that flowed over 800,000 gallons. Andy Buxbaum is the vice president of Conservation Action for the National Wildlife Federation and has been tracking Enbridge's activity in the Midwest. Even when they put booms up, they finally got booms out there, um, the flow was so, so, so great. It just blew the oil right by the booms. Within just a few days, the oil extended 35 miles downstream. And that's where you get those horrible pictures of oil um, on grasses, on, on beaches, on wildlife. Line 6B crosses through the town of Marshall, Michigan at Talmadge Creek, a wetland that flows into the larger Kalamazoo River. The pipeline break was a bona fide disaster, with cleanup costing Enbridge approximately $1.2 billion and lasted until 2014. If residents of the Great Lakes region weren't familiar with Enbridge before, they were now. Before 2010, um, I don't think anybody knew that there were, there were pipelines, much less where they were. We were completely shocked to, to find out that there was a pipeline actually lying at the bottom of the Straits of Mackinac. Michigan residents realized that Line 6B wasn't the only pipeline in their backyard. Enbridge has an extensive pipeline network running through the Great Lakes region, and one pipeline in particular running through the Great Lakes themselves. Line 5 travels from Superior, Wisconsin, through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and then splits into two 20-inch pipelines as it crosses the five-mile-wide strait between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. The twin pipelines follow the contours of the lake bottom, reaching depths of over 200 feet. It's 61 years old. It's never been replaced. It's owned and operated by Enbridge, which is the same company responsible for the largest inland oil spill in history. So you've got the iconic image of the Great Lakes, and right almost directly underneath it, there's this ticking time bomb. This is what an oil spill would look like in the Straits of Mackinac. The colored dots show where the oil would travel within the lake's water tables. 
Red is near surface, yellow, mid-depth, blue, near bottom. The oil would travel far, fast, and in different directions. Already, after six days, these surface particles are down, heading into Rogers City, uh, 40 miles away from the Straits. Dave Schwab, a research scientist at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, created the computer models. I met with him to find out why the Straits were especially vulnerable to an oil spill. It's just this picture where it really spreads out there. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't run enough oil boom no. across to get any of this. And that's a consequence of this oscillating flow that's so powerful. The amount of water going through that strait when it's going one direction or the other at the peak is more than 10 times what goes over Niagara Falls. If only one of the aging pipelines in the Straits of Mackinac were to rupture and Enbridge was able to shut down the pipeline immediately, the best case scenario would be a 1.5 million gallon oil spill. A single color group represents that 1.5 million gallons and how it would move through the straits if it were released. Particles that were released at mid-depth are now almost equally distributed between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. After I finished doing the um, simulations, making the animations, I sat down and I thought, well, what's the story here? What is this really telling people? What's it telling me? Um, and what it told me is that I can't imagine another place in the Great Lakes where it be more devastating to have an oil spill in terms of the amount of shoreline that would be impacted and the speed that it would be impacted at. It's not until you get up to the middle of the bridge that you realize how big these lakes are. It looks like a fucking ocean. And all this water is at risk. The Straits of Mackinac. People flock here by the millions each year. The pristine beaches and the clear water of the surrounding counties drive an $800 million a year tourist economy. But the iconic bridge and the oil pipeline nearly beneath it weren't always here. Line 5 was built over 60 years ago, which means there aren't a lot of people alive today who actually worked on it. We tracked down a man by the name of Bruce Trudgeon, who spent the summer of 1953 working on the pipeline. And this is where I spent the summer, on the end of the causeway, sitting here with my transit, turning angles on the dredges to help them locate where they were out there to do their dredging. It wasn't, that, was not a full, that was not a full-time job. That's not you, is it? That's me, that's me. <laughs> I was 21 that summer. I'm probably the youngest living person that still worked on that project. That was a, it was a big deal up there. Initially, the pipeline went as far as the western end of Lake Superior, and then they took it by boat. But in 53, they decided to put a pipeline the rest of the way, which ran across the UP down to Sarnia. And the problem was getting this oil across the Straits of Mackinac. They welded the pipes up on the North Shore, put a cable across the bottom of the straights, put a big winch on the south shore and dragged them across. And as they dragged them, they welded more a pipe. And so they had these two pipes four miles along dragged across the bottom of the straits. This was five times longer than had ever been done before. How long is the pipeline supposed to last? At that time, they said 50 years. This pipe is going to last 50 years. So Enbridge has decided it's good way past 50 years, so they didn't put it there. <laughs> when they inspect these things, they're simply looking for corrosion. They can't see inside, and they can't determine the stress of the pipe. But they can look for how the pipe is supported. The only thing that can weaken the pipes is corrosion, unless you bend them by not supporting them properly. So what's that orange spike there? That indicates below that is where the pipe is. You'll find one on the south shore. Those are all over the state of Michigan. That's all you'll find out there. Talking with Bruce got us worried. We wanted to know more about the condition of the 62-year-old pipelines in the Straits. Were they still supported properly? Was there any corrosion? We met with Beth Wallace, a pipeline safety advocate. She offered to take us where the lines enter the water and tell us more about their condition. 
we could find out very little about the pipeline. We just basically knew it was there um, in the age. When was this line last inspected? What, did, what were the results of that inspection? Uh, that's basic information the public should have and we just, we cannot get. We had filed two FOIAs that were ignored for the large part. The FOIAs were asking for inspections. We know that Enbridge went down and took footage, but they weren't releasing the footage. And we, we weren't getting it from the federal agency, FEMSA. Finally, we decided we're gonna just dive it. And when we got out there, it was shocking. National Wildlife Federation divers captured footage of what many fear. He's in the water. Broken structural braces, and the pipelines covered in debris. But as the crew lowered their cameras deeper than they were able to dive, what they captured was truly worrisome. Sections of pipeline completely unsupported at a depth of over 200 feet. During the entirety of the dive, the team was watched closely by Enbridge from above and below. According to the original construction easement issued by the state of Michigan in 1953, Enbridge was to have anchors every 75 feet to prevent structural stress on the lines. And so uh, this year they just went out and they put in supports. They had to put in 40 some supports in order to come into compliance with the original easement. How, how did they construct this pipeline and not adhere, continue to do maintenance work, add anchors, add anchors, and then they still had to add 40 in order to comply with the original easement. And the state, the state basically slapped him on the hand, said, just get up to compliance and that's it. It's part of our ongoing maintenance. So this is planned. Um, you know, it wasn't anything that came out of the blue. We traveled down to Marshall, the site of the 2010 spill and the location of Enbridge's headquarters in Michigan. Jason Mancham, the company's public affairs specialist, elaborated on the condition of Line 5. In time, what happens is, you know, with currents through the straits, you know, the lake bed, it changes. Some areas, you know, might get washed away. So, you know, when the pipeline was new, of course we didn't have any spans like that. But over time, if the current starts to wash away a segment, and then it's unsupported for a length greater than 75 feet, that's where we now have to come in and we will brace the line with these six foot long screws uh, that go into the lake bottom and literally anchor it down there and provide that, that support. And again, if we need to add more in subsequent years, that's what we'll do. But it's again, just it's part of our ongoing maintenance. So it's What's your response to organizations who are taking it into their own hands to try to give information to the public? Yeah, a lot of these reports, are, they are very misleading and they are not entirely accurate. You know, the, the notion that um, a, a company like Enbridge would not maintain a line is just, that's just atrocious, it's quite false. Yet according to Enbridge's own data, there were over 800 spills in the U.S. and Canada between 1999 and 2010, and over 5 million gallons of oil released. Several of the largest spills were on Enbridge's lakehead system. November 1999, Crystal Falls, Michigan, 226,000 gallons spilled. July 2002, Cohasset, Minnesota, 252,000 gallons spilled. February 2007, Exelon, Wisconsin, over 200,000 gallons spilled. July 2010, Marshall, Michigan, over 800,000 gallons spilled. Is that just the, the cost of doing business as a pipeline company, that oil is going to be spilled and, and money needs to be allocated to environmental remediation? Of course we have, you know, we have environmental remediation um, as a top priority and we have obviously resources, monetary and personnel in that area. But the key to this is no releases are acceptable to Enbridge. Are we there yet? No, you know, clearly we're not. But I can, I can assure you that at the first sign that either one of those twin pipes in the Straits of Mackinac would need replacement, we would initiate that, that program. We would not wait. But according to federal pipeline regulations, the decision to replace or remove the line is left solely to Enbridge. There's no federal standard that sets the level of risk allowed for pipelines to fail. 
That means that, that each company sets its own risk parameters, how hard to push the oil, when to do repairs, an alarm goes off, what to do about it. The federal government has no standard for how those things are to be addressed. That's unconscionable. In July of 2014, Michigan's newly formed Petroleum Pipeline Task Force concluded a year-long inquiry into Line 5 and the release of an 80-page report. It slammed Enbridge for information gaps in how the company conducts pipeline integrity inspections and the results of those inspections. Despite recommending a study of what a worst case scenario spill in the Straits would cost and ensuring that Enbridge has enough insurance to cover those costs, there were no calls from the state of Michigan to remove the 62-year-old pipeline from the Great Lakes. Regulatory efforts continue to focus on the financial liabilities of petroleum transport. And that furthers the idea that oil spills are just the cost of doing business for pipeline operators. Meanwhile, residents of the Great Lakes region continue to worry about their most valuable asset. When you talk to people in this region about a threat to the Great Lakes, they take it personally. They take it like it's a threat to them and their families. There is nothing more important than the health of the Great Lakes. There's nothing. 